Well, hello, this is Matt Orozco from Macabre Daily, and I am so excited to be joined by two amazing folks from the film Black Friday coming out on November 19th. We have director Casey Tivo and star Ivana Baquero. Um, so say hello to everybody. Uh, thank you both for taking the time uh, this, uh, this morning and afternoon to speak. Um, I think I'll start off by saying I uh, absolutely love Black Friday. Uh, it was really- well, thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, my opinion is means about this much, but at the same time, I was pleasantly surprised when I watched it because it reminded me so, of so many movies that I love, but also felt unique in its own way. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But my first question is a very broad one, which is, has either of you ever worked in retail? And, have, and if so, have you ever worked on a Black Friday before? Mine's going to be a short answer because it's no, I, I haven't. I, I started so young. I started acting when I was about eight years old. So I've never had to sort of do anything other than that. Um, but no, I, and then plus in Spain, we don't, we actually do have Black Friday now, but it, it wasn't a thing back when I was growing up. So no. <laughs> it's uniquely American, isn't it? And at least it used yeah. to be. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I didn't have any, um, retail experience um, because I've refused to get a real job most of my life um, so I you know when I became a filmmaker and started having children I was making sure that I was getting jobs that could um, support a family so thank god for that um, but you know it's funny I, I did a thing with Bruce yesterday and um, they asked us the same question and my first real exposure to Black Friday was maybe 10 years ago. My sister-in-law was, we were all having Thanksgiving dinner and at like 7 p.m. she was getting in her pajamas. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I have to get up at four. And I was like, why would you get up at four the day after Thanksgiving? She's like, oh, Black Friday sales. And I was like, oh, you're a sociopath. So that's- She was I mean, going shopping? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so- <laughs> Yeah. So all of the women that turn into uh, monsters in the movie that that are getting, you know, killed by our, our amazing cast, I, they really deserve it. So, you know, <laughs> you know as a, having worked in retail very early in my in my life, uh, I totally agree. I think it's a very difficult uh, spot to be in. And it's almost surprising there hasn't been a movie to talk about the absurdity of it up to this point. But I'm glad that you all have have created it. And to that end, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that this has, movies entered a rank of films that fits a very specific niche, you know, films like Night of the Creeps, Night of the Comet, not all of them start with Night of, uh, but they have this kind of alien invasion motif meets horror and comedy. And so I was wondering, you know, Casey, for you as a director, what approach did you take to try to, to differentiate Black Friday from, you know, films that have a similar tone to it? And were you aware of those other films in the process of, of, uh, of directing Black Friday? Yes. Um, my buddy, Edward Ham Jr., who's a, a producer, he produced um, Get Out, Black Klansman, a bunch of other movies. We were having a conversation last night about going to see something in the theaters. And he made a comment to me, he goes, well, I know you see everything anyway, because I do. I literally try to watch every movie I can. I, I, I used to watch two movies a night. Um, I would watch one usually with my wife, um, at the time and then I would watch one by myself after that so I think that you can't help but be inspired by those movies because you know you've seen them somewhere along down the line you know what I mean um, I it's a little early for me so if I trail off I apologize <laughs> totally fine um, I think my approach was was more like um you know, I remember asking Chris Columbus early on, I'm not, to, I'm not trying to name drop, but these are, these people are important to me because you have to lean on other professionals to like, make sure you don't completely fuck this thing up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I remember texting Chris and being like, Hey, this movie's funny. Like I, I want to make sure that I don't, I, I have a philosophy that, that he sort of echoed, which is like, if you go into a movie like this and you tell everyone, hey, we're making this comedy. Hey, we're making this crazy, gory comedy. Like everybody's going to try to yuck, yuck, yuck and bring all the laughs. And, and, and that can be dangerous because then everybody's trying to out funny each other. You know, like Bruce Campbell is naturally hilarious and Stephen Peck is naturally hilarious. And 
Ivana and Devin, I think, brought a little more weight to the movie. So to combine all those those things makes it a little more realistic. And I, I didn't want to go for, I feel like with the wrong people attached, Andy could have turned this movie without him knowing into like a Sharknado type of thing where it's just over the top and not the movie that you want. That, that's, that's just my opinion. So that, that's kind of how I feel. I would agree. I mean, I think it's a really difficult task to balance horror and comedy effectively, especially with, you know, doing both well. And which I think is why we have so few that you could consider to be um, really effective horror sci-fi yeah. comedies is that it's just yeah. hard to balance that tone. And, you know, Ivana, when you were thinking about your approach to how you were going to play Marnie, it's a really authentic character. And I think what Casey just said makes a lot of sense and that it does bring this kind of weight of balance to the, to the cast where you have the silliness of kind of some what's happening and just the natural character um, that some of these actors bring, but at the same time, you bring kind of this, this authenticity to the character of Marnie that, you know, doesn't feel like really much of, of acting as much as you are just playing that character like you should. So how much of that, that character- That's was... just because she's such an amazing actor. Don't, don't discredit how great she is. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, as a, as a I, I was going to leave this for after the recording stop, but Pan's Labyrinth is my favorite movie of all time. So uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, keenly wow. aware of Ivana's of uh, talents, but I was wondering, you know, as far as the way the character was written, how much of that was on the page and how much of that did you bring to the character just from your own improvisation? Most of it was on the paper. I have to say that Andy um, did such an amazing job with the script. And obviously the script was the first thing I ever saw, um, even before speaking to Casey, before talking to anyone, even before knowing he was going to be attached. And I remember reading it and wanting to, to, keep reading and and I read it so fast that I thought if the movie has this if they if they manage to sort of convey the script into the movie it's going to be amazing because it, you keep wanting to know what happens and like you say it, it's kind it's not you can't really say that it's a full on comedy but the things that happen around it lends to the comedy of it um so when I read it I was like this is something I've never done before this is amazing in terms of the character, Marnie, like I said, it, it was pretty much on the script, but what's amazing about Casey is that he really allowed us to, to sort of dive into the characters and have fun with them. So there were a lot of elements that I did add. Um, I personally love knowing where these characters come from. And I did this, I mean, I kept calling him and he, I remember Casey was like, you do you Ivana, like, I'm sure you're gonna, you're gonna get it right. But I kept doing these things and, and all this background for Marnie, which helped me um, on the day. And I was so grateful that I was allowed to, to bring sort of my own ideas on the table, but also to have all the material to work with that Andy had already laid out for us. Yeah, I, I mean, I, as I said, I think it's such an authentic character. You can definitely tell that there is a sense of history to all of these characters, in particular Marnie. You know, there's a scene with Devin that I think, and I don't want to go into spoiler territory too much, but there's a lot of really tender moments that are kind of sandwiched in between some really absurd ones. And um, I'm wondering, you know, this movie looked like just a blast. I mean, it was a, it was a lot of fun to watch. I'm wondering, was that same sentiment on the set when you all are making it? Was it just as fun to make as it was, you know, what ended up on the screen, the final product? Oh, to, to me, it was. I don't know about Casey, but to me, it was a lot of fun. It was amazing. And the cast truly was so, so cool. It was, it was interesting, though, because of COVID, I have to say, in yeah. that I, I'm used to hanging out with everyone a lot more. And, and you need to create those bonds, especially in this movie where these characters are supposed to sort of be like a dysfunctional family and they've known each other for months and years. And it was strange to not be able to have that and to, you know, bond personally. But with all that being said, I think on set, there was this great balance between obviously work, but also fun and lightness. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we lucked out. Um, I would say 95% of the crew and cast, I mean, the cast at least was 
you know, it's funny. I remember I used to listen to Howard Stern when I was a kid and you would have these actors and directors on and they would be like, oh, this person was amazing. And this person was amazing. And I'm like, you're all full of shit. You all don't like each other that much. But after this experience, I was like, oh, it really can be like that. You know what I mean? Like I stayed in touch with Devin and Ivana and Bruce and everybody after we wrapped. And the experience on set was everybody got along and everybody was in it together. And there wasn't any like, negativity or animosity and um it was a really fun time but like Ivana said the, the COVID thing was difficult because especially as a director you know Bruce said something great yesterday he said you know when I got when I read the script I I the first thing before I even read the first pages I didn't want to be playing Ash again he goes and when I read the movie he goes you know it was fun and it was scary he goes but this to me was more like a movie about the characters he, and he, he said, you know, Casey did a great job of bringing out the characters and making it more of like a personable movie. And I think the, the difficult thing about that was during COVID, it's like, if I wanted to talk to Ivana and say, hey, look, well, first of all, Ivana doesn't need any talking to. She can get it at the first take every time. I've never seen an actor do that. It's, it's quite something. Um, and I'm not saying that just because she's here. I've said that in other <laughs> interviews, by the way. Um, if I wanted to talk to her and say, hey, look, what do you think about, you know, I had a mask on and I had a face shield over my face. And it's like when you're trying to have an intimate conversation between a director and an actor about, you know, there's there's some serious scenes in this movie, especially in the in the, the warehouse. It's like if I want to talk to her, or Devin, it, it's like being in like this like almost military type of stuff. Well, so, has like, yeah. Yeah. So that was difficult for sure. And that made it a little more stressful. And I was on edge a couple of days, but it's really nothing more than the constriction of being behind that stuff. But other than that, it was it was a great, great experience. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely looked that way. I mean, again, we can only observe so much from what the final product shows us. But I think to that point around this is a character film, you know, you really are rooting for all of these characters in their own way. I mean, I think every as watching this, I kind of found a bit of myself in parts of them. You know, uh, the question of even the Bruce Campbell character when he says something on the effect of, you know, they're kind of sounding off how long they've been working there. Yeah. And I've been in that situation before where you're kind of like commiserating with your colleagues and you're just kind of sounding off, all right, who's the oldest homogeneous person that's been working here the longest? I'm like, how has that changed that person? And, you know, um, I think that, again, it is a testament to the cast, you know, Ivana and, and your, and your co colleagues that you all are able to bring this to life in such a way that isn't just about, the, the gore, the aliens, the absurdity, it is really about the characters. And I go back to movies like, you know, Slither as a great example is where oh, I love that it's, it's a concept that largely is, you know, it's, 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 it's been done, but it, the way it's done and the people that do it are what make it unique. And I think that's really what stuck out with me with Black Friday. Um, and on that note of like balancing the horror and the comedy, you know, it's really hard. You know, Casey and Yvonne, I'll ask you a very similar question, you know, but Casey, from your perspective, what, how did you manage the tonal changes that happened in the script? And what was the most challenging part of doing that? Um, when Andy sent me the script originally, it was much darker. And what I mean by that is like that first scene where Chris Ryan Lee gets attacked by that woman, like he ended up killing a little girl, like her daughter, you know what I mean? And Jonathan's character arc for Bruce was much darker and Devin's character was was much more of sort of a loser and I said Andy I was like look let's let's make this more for everybody let's give Devin's you know Andy Andy went and rewrote that whole intro with with Ken with his daughters and Chris at Thanksgiving because I said to him we need to let people no, and it's funny, Fred, Ra I believe it was Fred Raskin, who's Tarantino's editor, watched it and said, well, where's Marnie's family? I wanted to see where Marnie's family was. So we kind of slighted Ivana uh, by not giving her the pre-Toy Store scene. Um, so it's, it's, um, <sighs> comedy is very difficult. You know, I think if you look at something like I can watch old episodes of something like Saturday Night Live and be doubled over in laughter, but watch the new Saturday Night Live. And I'm not sure it resonates with me, maybe because I'm older, maybe because I'm Gen X, I don't know. So Andy has a much younger um, sort of current sense of humor. I think Andy would be a great writer on something like Community or Parks and Rec. And I particularly don't watch those shows. 
So you sort of have to find common ground where you think certain things will work for everybody. And it's not easy, you know, it's not easy. So um, that, that's, it's a really hard thing to do. I mean, if you look at it now, like the industry itself, I think super bad is like the last real quote unquote kind of classic comedy that, that everybody loves. And that's seven, eight years ago or whatever it is. So comedy is, is in a very strange place. So you just have to sort of take your best shot and hope everybody gets it. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I think uh, comedy is an, is an interesting spot because we're in this state where we're not sure what we can say and if yep. it's funny or not, you know? And I think right. to some extent I was watching Black Friday thinking, is this going to overstep or is it going to understep? Because that really is the dance, right? Is like, how do we do just enough to get the laugh without going too far where we're starting to exploit or make fun of? Yeah. Um, and the same with horror, you know, it's like, how do you show too much, not enough? So Ivana, from your perspective on the acting side, you know, what was it like managing the tonal changes in the script along with the cast? You know, you all are professionals, you all are amazing at what you do. But at the same time, you know, that, that um, I'm imagining there's a kind of a group effort that goes into delivering this, this, this scene with the tone correct. So was that difficult for you to manage those changes? And was there anything that stuck out as far as being uh, extra easy or maybe extra difficult? I think um, truly, and again, like I know Casey said that before, but I'm not saying it because Casey's here, but truly Casey and Andy really laid the groundwork for us. And we kind of, we each sort of knew what our place was. And like Casey just said, Marnie was supposed to be more grounded. And in her particular case, her humor was more sort of fed by what was happening around her and not necessarily her sort of cracking the jokes or saying certain lines. And there were other characters that really, really had the comedy in them, like Steven, like Bruce Campbell. Campbell. Um, so that was, that sort of, it was easy for us to sort of do that because we already had the manual and the instructions. Um, and there was something that you said before that really sort of resonated with me, which is you said that you saw a little bit of yourself in every one of the characters. And to me, that is probably the highest compliment you can give an actor to truly, you know, tell them that that what they did was realistic. Even in the comedy and the craziness of it all, that you could really see yourself reflected in that situation. And and yeah, I mean, all I can say really is that it was it was for sure a team effort, but but Casey and Andy gave us the manual and the instructions and it was and it was a smooth ride. Yeah, we had a different experience because Andy, luckily Andy was there with us. So okay. yeah. there was um, the knock knock joke that Ivana had at the front. It was written a different way. And then Andy was there and he was like, no, no, let's do this donut one. And he changed it last minute. So thank God he did because it works, you know? And those tonal shifts, the funniest one to me is like when I've seen it with audiences at Fantastic Fest or whatever is um, right after the shit hits the fan and, and Marnie's in the office with little sweet little old Ruth. And she's like, oh, your man, he's so handsome. I love him. <laughs> and she's like, oh, he's not really my boyfriend. And she's like, oh, like you guys are just fucking each other or whatever. Like, like you never in a million years would think that would work. Exactly. But Exactly. Every time I've seen it with an audience, people are fucking roaring. So it's, you, you get lucky, yeah. you, know, you get lucky. Yeah, I, I have to add to that. I totally agree. And, and perhaps I expressed myself horribly before, but there was a lot of that. It was just kind of, you know, just doing what, what, what it's, what you were supposed to do and, and hoping that it would work. And a lot of those scenes, like, like Ruth's scene, I, when we were shooting it, I wasn't even sure whether it was going to be funny or not. I mean, it, it, it was a, it was a fun little scene, but I was like, are people going to laugh? Are people going to, you know, be grossed out by it? Are people going to not quite get it? I don't know, but we just sort of did it. And somehow it all worked really yeah, well. Yeah. And you have to also attribute that to our editor, Chris Tonic, who yeah. Chris was an assistant. That's the reason I brought up Fred Raskin. Chris was an assistant who worked on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He worked on The Suicide Squad and Black Friday is his first feature editing job. And there's a great scene where they're talking about uh, the, ori the origins of Black Friday and Ruth goes, when I, when I was younger, they separated shoppers by race. And like, I didn't even think of it, but Chris cuts to this reaction shot of Michael Jai White. And like every time in the theater, 
people are roaring because Chris did an amazing job of digging out what the reaction should be. So I think you have to give him credit too. You know, Chris, amazing guy, an incredible editor, hoping he does every movie I make, you know, so, so hats off to him. Love yeah. you, Chris. <laughs> The you can, the uh, the editor is the unsung hero of of filmmaking because it is ultimately you know the, what you see is a product of the, of what was filmed and then who and then the editor putting it all together and you all put together a wonderful ninety minute film which is more rare than it used to be um, but I find now that as I get older my um, wantingness for my time is if you can fit it into ninety minutes that's a really sweet a sweet spot for a film and I even wrote down I mean on the point of like just the genuine comedy here. My notes when I was watching it are just more my stream of thought. And one of them was just is in double stars. This is fucking funny. Uh, like, because because it really was. Like, there's just, you're genuinely laughing, not because the jokes are forced, not because it's kind of really trying to trigger anything. It's just because it's natural in the characters. Again, going back to this character interactions really are what drive a story like this to make it stand out rather than the events that take place because, you know, you can watch Alien Invasion, you can watch, you know, body horror, all of that. And even things like the new guy. I mean, the new guy running joke and just seeing the new guy continually get more and more disgusting. Um, you know, the, the even the roots, like when the scene where we find out what happens to him, you yeah. know, like it all just kind of throws you for a loop. It had me thinking of things like Peter Jackson's Dead Alive or the absurdity <laughs> yeah. of just like how it gets out of hand. So um, yeah. on, the, uh, on the production side, you know, was there anything you ran into that maybe you ran into any snags that you had to pivot around? I mean, obviously you mentioned COVID as being one, but was there anything else that occurred that maybe, oh, we really tried to get something like this done, but it just wasn't possible? Um, anything like that that was left behind or couldn't get accomplished? Um, yes, you know, I'm not gonna blame any shortcomings of the film on COVID, but what I will say is that, you know, there's a piece of me that feels bad for Andy in a sense that the movie that he wrote that, you know, if we would have had a couple of hundred extras running through the store as infected shoppers, it would have made it a different movie and probably more a little close to the panic that Andy had initially written. But when, when we got all the COVID guidelines from SAG and IATSE, they were like, nope, five extras at a time. And it's like, how the hell are you supposed to make a, a zombie slash monster movie with, with infected shoppers with five people at a time? And that was a little heartbreaking for me. Uh, don't get me wrong. I have zero regrets. I love the movie. And I've gotten a, um, some amazing um, people emailing me, texting me how much they love it. But there's that. And there's also, and I think I had sent to maybe Devin and Ivana and a couple other people. When I first hired David Cruda, who is a cinematographer, if you, if you Google David Cruda and look at his work, one of his sort of his, I don't want to say his knack, but one of his um, his strong suits, his superpower, if you will, is working with the elements. He's amazing with like smog and 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 um, mists and things like that. And that's what I wanted the store to look like once we we started things started going bad. And when we got there, they were like, "Nope, no smoke, no smog." And David mm -hmm. was like, you, "You've got to be kidding me!" You know what I mean? Like that's like asking Ivana to act with a, a bag over her head. You know what I mean? Like she can't use her face to express all the things she needs to express when you take away David's tools. So we had to sort of do a lot of the, a lot of the smoke was done in post and it, it doesn't really look like the way that David and I wanted it to, but it, it is what it is because we shot during COVID. So that's, that's the real sort of th thorn in my paw, you know, for this movie, for sure. Yvonne, anything yeah. come to mind from here? Well, I mean, I'm most of what Casey said and in my, I guess, experience specifically, it was more so the isolation, I guess, like I said before, the incapability to really bond with the castmates, not only out, but in set, because obviously we were separated. We had, you know, glass between us, we had the masks, we had the screens. Um, so that could, you know, get a little bit awkward sometimes, especially in terms of communicating, because as soon as we cut, we obviously had to, you know, gear up and if we needed touch ups and, you know, all those things that go on, we had to go to a really sort of isolated particular place to do all of that. Um, so I guess those were little things, but like Casey said, we were able to ultimately do the movie and, and make what we wanted to. So we can't really complain about the protocols, but I have to say that this was even before vaccination. So right. this was like, this right. was full on, full on pandemic where we really had 
to be prudent and careful. And so, so it was, it was very strict and we never shut down because if we had shut down, I mean, this was a relatively small movie. I don't know what would have happened. No, remember so we, did, we, did, we did lose one, remember we lost a day? Oh, the first one, yep. That sure. was like the second day. The, the first day we did the opening of the store, the second day was supposed to be all the cast, you know, doing, meeting each other at the store and whatever. And they're like, oh, we got to shut down because, um, David, our DP, his, his test didn't go through. He wasn't positive. It just meant that when they took it to the lab, they couldn't find a sample to use. So IATSE and SAG made us shut down for the day. So mm -hmm. that sucks, you know? There you uh, go, yeah. It was uh, a little taste. So yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we right. really got it together after that. <laughs> well, hopefully, I mean, with vaccinations and thing, a lot of this, a lot of the restrictions that were placed on on the sets how, will eventually be lifted and there's and some of that return to some level of normalcy um but i think you know on the point of this being you know possibly being a bigger film you know because they weren't able to get the extras or thing i think the small i think the intimacy actually works i you know in a yeah. lot of ways because you know it's um i think it's impressive how much you get away with with the location you're using right you know you have pretty much a warehouse and a decrepit store but those sets are used so well to make you feel like not only are you, you know, stuck, because if you've ever been behind a retail store, right, you kind of get how big they actually are. Yeah. Um, but you get the one sense the funny, that there's... One of the funniest things I read was um, somebody on Letterboxd was like, or YouTube, the YouTube comments under the trailer was like, oh, yeah, friggin' typical, make this dumb movie in a warehouse, like terrible production design. <laughs> we actually shot it in an old Babies R Us, so it's like, it, it was a toy store, for lack of a better term, you know? Yeah. So, hilarious. Of course, of course, people on the internet know everything, but what a oh, warehouse should look like. So. I mean, it's it's just, you know, it's like, I've been, re Andy and I have been te texting each other reviews, <laughs> and it's like, some people are like, oh my God, this is, love this movie, one of my new favorites, watch it every holiday, and then one person's like, fuck this movie. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so God bless the internet. <laughs> So it's so constructive, right? Um, <laughs> but I mean, I definitely will say this is this is entering my holiday film rotation um, uh, because awesome. not only does Black Friday a holiday that needed a film like this, but they're yeah. severely lacking in some new holiday holiday horror sci-fi fare. Um, yeah. On on the note of like the effects, you know, I thought um, there was a really good, a really really great effort to blend both practical and CGI. And I think that CGI is becoming so much more pervasive in what we're doing. And, and you know, we can poo-poo it all we want, but I think there's a point to what you can get away with, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think of, I, without getting yeah, spoiler territory, uh, there's a scene with a forklift that will forever change. I mean, if if I, if no one else finds that funny, I, I at least know that I got such a kick out of it. I had to rewind it. Like, let me see that again. Um, but <laughs> was it, um, you know, what were your least favorite scenes? And again, Yvonne, I think from, from your perspective, you know, as far as an actor goes, in the case of your perspective, as far as far the, the, the direction side, what were some of your most and least favorite scenes involving the, involving the effects? Um, in terms of working on them on set or watching or, it? After? Working with them, like as far as like kind of, you know, the, like if you had to go through makeup or was it CGI, was it, you know, harder, more difficult to film with this kind of imaginary? We, oh, I had an easy ride. I, I can't complain. I mean, it was very easy. But I had so much fun, like beating up alien zombies and being thrown into blood. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I don't think I have a least favorite. I mean, I do remember it was tricky running on set because there was like a lot of blood splattered on the floor and we had to keep continuity and not slip. So that, that was a bit of a challenge. But I, I didn't really get to have like anything, any sort of practical effects on me. I was able to, I had the pleasure of watching Robert Kurtzman work on, on those creations. So for me, it was, it was a very easy ride. So I had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also, side. My, one of my, my favorite um, scene involving effects is when Ivana beats the shit out of that guy with the pipe wrench. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you hear these stories of like directors watching movies with real audiences and not letting audiences know that they're there. And when we went to see it at Fantastic Fest, there was a couple of moments in the movie where you could see the audience reacting. And that scene where she beats the shit out of this person, um, 
I, I could see people like, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, oh, we did our job, you know, thank God. But I remember, yeah, and I remember you kept telling me, I, have, I want it to be violent, you know, I, I, want, I want you to grunt. And I was like, you look like you're really mad. You look really horrible. mad. Oh, uh, it's so great. What were you channeling in your head at that moment, Ivana? What was kind of your inspiration to just get more aggressive on this on this head? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. I had a lot of things <laughs> running through my head that I was beating up. <laughs> well, it's a good way to get them out in a in a in a way that both benefits the film and possibly maybe some therapeutic uh, relief as well. Now. Sure. Um, do either of you have any of your own like Black Friday horror stories? I mean, as I mentioned in the beginning, I worked in retail, so I've dealt with, uh, I think you deal with some of the least and most savory people um, that that this place has to offer, but any of your own horror stories from this event that you've ever experienced yourself personally? Not me. I, I stay away from Black Friday. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could give you a super juicy story because I love shopping, but I... Um... I haven't really lived through Black Friday over here in Spain, so no. I think I think that if if any for anyone who's never experienced Black Friday, you know the the, the blessing and the curse that is the internet. Th there is like horrific videos on the internet of like people fighting on Black Friday, and I just I think it's funny and ironic that Ivana says, "Well, we don't really have that in Spain." It's like Black Friday is such an inherently American holiday. It's like, hey kick somebody's ass for a discount TV, like that's America in a nutshell, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like you can go to places like Spain or, or, or uh, France, the, the, at least I think, I could be wrong, but when I was there, I was there a lot through the, um, you know, the 2010 to 2015 or so touring, um, the, the retail footprint doesn't seem to be as big in Europe, you know, in America, we're getting to the point where every town pretty much looks the same. It's like Target, Walmart, Best Buy, grocery store, gym, liquor store. You go to places like Europe, you know, there's still that romantic sort of architecture and elegance and mom and pop type of stores. And, and Black Friday is like, it's just get out of the way, man. Just get his, get what you can and get it now. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. Yeah, I was when I was writing, um, when I was putting together the review that'll go up on the site. You know, I made sure to link to some of the videos of these these stampedes that occur uh, in shopping because they are something of their own to behold. And you know, and even thinking about this, this is a uniquely Western holiday, right? To celebrate this idea of we're going to wake up early to go get a deal uh, on something. So it is. Um, I think. I think to some extent, it's almost like there, it's, it's surprising to me that there wasn't a film yet that had made fun of this event because of how absurd it really is. But I think you captured the hysteria so well, not just through the characters you're portraying. You know, again, of the because I think people that never worked retail don't understand what it's like. But it's surprising again that you haven't, Ivana, because really it felt like everyone in that cast had probably shadowed someone in retail at some point. I mean, Mike, Michael, Michael J. White's character, for example, like there's always this, there, you, there's these tropes that exist in retail. Of, like there's this tough guy, you know, there's, there's the nice person who's been working there, like Ruth, you know, there's the manager who's just drinking the Kool-Aid from every which way. So you really hit on the, on those tropes really, really well. And uh, I think kind of the last question I want to get from you both is, you know, well, the way that's that's an a trip that's that's a, a tip of the hat to Andy because Andy told yeah. me he, yeah. he had worked nothing but retail mm -hmm. up until like two years ago, from like sixteen to like twenty six he worked Toys R Us, Bed Bath and Beyond, Best Buy like he is the retail king so he it came out in the script his experience yeah. came out in the script. And on that note, we didn't really have to shadow anyone because we really did feed off him. And we yeah. were pretty much shadowing his experience. He was there on set. So any questions, any feedback, he would also obviously contribute. Yeah, he was like the screenwriter slash technical advisor because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he knows it all. Emotional support, everything. <laughs> yeah. It's good to have some, I mean, again, you write what you know, and if you, and, and you can always, I think you can always tell uh, when someone has coming from an experience, it shows up in the way they develop the characters, the script, the writing. Um, and on a final note, you know, as far as any upcoming projects, is there anything you both are going to be working on that we could be looking out for aside from Black Friday? You know, I mean, this is coming out in theaters on Friday as well as VOD. So I'm hoping that everyone goes and sees it because uh, it's exactly the kind of pick you up kind of 
fun that I think uh, I've been craving for some time. But uh, is there anything else you all are working on that we can look forward to? Ivana, you go first. Not yet. There's things coming up, but I can't really speak of anything just yet. Um, but at the moment, I'm just full on promoting Black Friday and looking forward to everyone really watching it and having fun watching it. I think it's a great holiday movie. Same. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, I mean, I have a few things in the pipe, but I, I think if I talk about them, I could get in trouble. So I don't, I don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I, I want to thank you both again for the time and the conversation. And I want to encourage everyone watching this, listening to this, however you're getting this, to go check out Black Friday on the 19th of November. Um, it really is one of the most fun films you're going to see this year, especially when we're constantly getting um, films that are dealing with some real heavy and deep shit. Uh, it's nice to just be able to tune out on something that uh, you can have some fun with. So thank you to you both and best of luck with the release. Thanks, thank Matt. you, Matt. Bye-bye, Casey. Bye. Bye, Vanna. Bye. Bye. Bye.